All right, welcome to the Gridiron Stud Show. Chad Wilson, Emil Calamino, at it again. Emil, we're not only getting down to the end of the football season, we're getting down to the end of the year. Can you believe that, how quickly that happened? It did go by quickly, didn't it? It was. I said that the other day. 2021 was, I don't know what it was, at least for me, it just seemed like it blew by. Yeah, uh, I would say the same for me as well. You know, 20. 2020 went a little slower. I can call it the pandemic, being in a house, whatever the case may be. But uh, 2021 went rather quickly. So here we are in December, and uh, we've reached the end of the college football regular season. So there's stuff to talk about there. We have formulated a playoff. I did talk about this in my show yesterday, but would love to get your thoughts on how the Final Four did shake out and what we saw on Championship Week. We'll talk about that. Uh, there's a high-profile transfer on the move, but there's some news there that I think is noteworthy. We'll talk about that today. Um, one of these, you, listen, we've had big-time contracts tossed around in college football this offseason, but there was one contract that was ready to stand above them all. We'll talk about that on the show today. The Bills and the Pats had a thriller. Emil, did you see that wide-open football game? On Monday night, I mean, it was... Uh, I did. I saw Matt Jones was two for three with a double. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what it looked like. Um, uh, it was things... Uh, it was a it was a leather helmet type deal um, went on. So we'll talk about that a little bit, and plus the AFC playoff race. But the main topic here today is, Emil and I, even with jobs still open, are going to rank the biggest of the big off-season hires in college football. Yeah, we're going to do that, even with still pending news sitting out there on a program or two. Emil and I are going to rank the top hires so far this off-season, and I don't think we've ever had an off-season where such high-profile jobs have been open and filled, Emil. Um, we're going to have a good time ranking that. There's you, know, you know what happened, too? This year was kind of odd. You know, every once in a while, uh, we'll call it the coaching carousel, you get these things that go down, but... They steal a guy from, uh, you know, a lower profile, uh, you know, program like mm. the MAC where they, they, they promote an assistant coach. And that kind of stops the dominoes because sure. there's not another job. In this case, they were all pilfering guys off each other. So yeah. it just kept building upon itself. Exactly. One thing leads to another. That was, uh, one, you know, it was a famous song from the 80s. I don't remember who sang it, but. No, neither do I. Yeah, um, but it definitely called for that. All right, so we're going to do that. Plus, we've got picks for you. We've got to wrap up what went on last week, and there's no college football this weekend. We will be totally, 100%, solely focused on the NFL. Hey, wash your mouth out with soap. The great American game is this weekend. I'm sorry. Army, Navy, I forget. I forget. We're not picking that. Sorry. No. <laughs> if, if you were here looking for that, go ahead and tune out right now. It is now. a great game, though. It is a cool game. I like it. It is. Um, I, I would agree with that. It's probably more for folks in our age bracket. I don't think the young folks really give a rip about that. But, you know, it is It is what it is, as they say. Before we jump into these topics and get rolling on um, what needs to be talked about here on the show, go ahead and subscribe on whatever you are using to stream this podcast right now, whether that's Spotify, Apple, or it is Anchor. Go ahead and drop that subscription right now. Press that button so you are notified, you get that lovely push notification the next time we drop a show. Um, Also, if you want to follow us on social media, you can find Emil on Facebook, E-M-I-L-C-A-L-O-M-I-N-O, just as it sounds. Uh, You can find him on Facebook, Waxing Poetic on sports, finance, politics, whatever you need. He's he's really like an encyclopedia. I had a professor in college who told me my name was musical. Is that right? Yes, he liked saying it. He said it was musical. Uh, was he high at the time? <laughs> no, it was, okay. no, I don't think so. But, but, but he, he was old. <laughs> All right. You <laughs> might want to check on the geezer. But anyway, if you're trying to follow me on Twitter, TikTok, Instagram, any of those things, at Gridiron Studs, check me out there. Um, always worth a follow because I will drop some stuff that will either inform you or piss you off. And those are real emotions that people must confront. I mean, they don't do mutually exclusive. I've seen you drop things that both inform and piss people off. In this day and age, Emil, informing people is likely to piss them off. Uh, so there you have it. Yes. Anyway. Yes, that's true. All right, jumping into this, I found this story um, kind of like 
don't know what the word is I want to use here, but I don't know if it's an indictment on the current state of college football. I don't know if it's just a symbol of what things are right now in college football. But Elias Ricks, the um, playmaking cornerback, I could say that from LSU, uh, is, you know, put himself in a transfer portal. Why? I don't know. Um, young man was playing well at a high profile program. Yes, the coach is gone. He left. So, uh, I guess he just, one of the schools that's better known for producing d- defensive backs in the NFL as well. So that's kind of, absolutely, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Definitely in the discussion. There've been guys that have come out of that program. Tyron Matthew, Patrick Peterson, just to name a few. Um, they had a, um, Jim Thorpe Award winner a couple of years ago and Grant Delpit. So why you would want to leave there, I have no idea, but I'm not here to pounce on a kid for that. A couple thousand others jumped in the transfer portal right with them. What I found odd was an announcement that Ohio State was out of the sweepstakes for Elias Ricks. Do you want to know why, Emil? They have fallen out of the sweepstakes for Elias Ricks out of fear of attrition. So apparently some way, somehow it was made known to the, to Ryan Day and the staff at Ohio State that if you brought Elias Ricks on, a couple of those guys that are currently in the Ohio State secondary are going to find themselves in a transfer portal. They'll go ahead and jump in there and bounce elsewhere too. How do you like them apples, Amy? But is there a reason behind it? Like, like, is it competition? Is it that they met the guy... Uh, at a camp in high school and they don't like him? I mean, seriously, I'm asking. I, what, what's the reason? Um, I don't have an exact reason. I would I would not... I would, not liking a guy personally, um, I don't think would be a reason for um, a guy to jump well, in a transfer gen- portal. That's our generation. Yeah, I don't think... Sure. I don't know. Yeah, I don't think that would be a reason for a guy to jump in a portal unless this guy's living in a dorm with you or you've been forced to share an apartment with him. Um, listen, they're going to be guys on your team you don't like, but on Saturday or throughout the week as you're putting your work in, you're a professional about it, even when you're 18 to 22 years old. So I'm venturing to say here, I think the players fear an agenda here. And I've often told people this, players don't fear competition. Like the fans are going to see that and be like, oh, these Ohio State defensive backs are, are scared to compete. Players aren't scared to compete. They've been doing that all their life, probably since six years old. What they have come to fear as they've gotten older is an agenda, which is if you bring Elias Ricks in, a high-profile corner like this, you didn't bring him in to stand next to the coach and watch these other guys play. Right. No, that that makes sense. I mean, you know, basically they're they're seeing it as, well, he's coming here. He's going to take a spot without even earning it. So what am I doing here? Maybe it's time for me to hit the road. Yeah, I think that's the thinking, and it com- comes from multiple guys. Because you don't want to be sitting here. I've been in the program, whether it's two years or three years or whatever. I've put in all my time, blood, sweat, tears. I've been a Buckeye. And this guy's going to come in here and get multiple chances to screw things up, um, whether that's in skill or that's learning the defense. He's just going to keep getting these chances while I'm sitting here watching it and um, knowing and feeling like I'm better. So... Um, it's highly unlikely that you would bring in a high-profile guy like Elias Ricks and not get him on the field. That's a, it's a, not a good look for you as a staff. It's not a good look for you if you decide to go in that transfer portal at any time in the future. And I think the players have sniffed that out. And some kind of way they made it known. Emil, uh, I, I got to tell you, this transfer portal, when, when it first came about, we, I think we talked about it on one of our shows. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I didn't think I liked it. Mm-hmm. And now seeing it in action, I know I don't like it. Yeah, you know, Emil, I'm with this constant fight of being adaptable to the changes that are happening in college football because, you know, the knock on people as they get older, they get rigid, they don't want to change, they don't want to move with the times. You know, ah, oh, what, what is this, a television, a telephone? What are you going to do? You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. So, but, you know, with all my hesitation, I've given it a chance. And as it stands right now, the way that it looks right now, and I think few people in their heart of hearts can argue against this, it looks like a mess. You've got kids jumping in there left and right. You've got kids jumping in there that don't belong in there. You've got kids jumping in there for seemingly no reason at all. You have a coaching change, and you don't even wait to see who the next guy... Like, immediately, guys jump into the portal. A couple of wide receivers at OU jumped in the portal immediately upon Riley leaving. You've got Elias Ricks leaving the first moment that he could. Um, and there have been several other guys. There was a quarterback 
the starting quarterback, um, and I want to say for, I'm probably going to get the school wrong here, but it might be Montana. I could be wrong. I probably need to look that up. Starting quarterback jumps in the transfer portal. Like, what's going on there? You know, so. Well, you know, I mean, as humans, we all tend to not like change. So, you know, I, I'm not so sure that's as much as an older person thing as just is a human thing. And yeah, as you get older, the fact is you do tend to get more rigid because you get set in your ways. But I try to look at things at least as best I can and say, what are the potential pitfalls of something before I, you know, poo poo it. And to me, this played out almost the way I envisioned it. It's, it's like free agency for college and players are using it instead of making informed decisions you, as things you just pointed out, like a new coach gets appointed or there's a coach that leaves, before they even see what, what's going to transpire, they're in this, this transfer portal, and you literally have, like, what is it, 600, 1,000? I don't know by the end of it. How many guys are in there? It's a lot. A couple thousand, probably? I mean, it's, you know, so... It's insane. I mean, what, what are we doing? It's almost, it's, it's worse than NFL. It it's is worse than, NFL. it's worse than free agency in that, at least in the NFL, you've got to play a couple of years. You've got to play three years, four years, five years. Um, and there are some provisions for a team to, you know, keep you an extra year or so. But in this deal, you could be like Quinn Ewers, the top uh, quarterback coming out. The, you do know about the kid that left high school early to pursue an NIL deal of $1.5 million. Uh, to go to Ohio State, and the kid was there for a semester, not even, and left. So you got right. It's ridiculous. And the thing is, coaches, you know, I mean, sure, we, you know, we want to give the kids some mobility. We don't want them stuck in a place, you know, where they couldn't. We, you know, there, there's two extremes here. You know, we had the old extreme from going back to the '60s and '70s, where they could block you from transferring. They mm -hmm. could tell you where you could go, which was the one extreme. And now we're in the exact opposite extreme, where you know, coaches are making decisions on a recruiting class based on saying, okay, even if it's a great quarterback, I'm going to have him three years. And then the kid's there three minutes. Right. <laughs> yeah, a um, couple of things going on. First, the kids, um, the higher-end kids, are making decisions about where they're going to school based on the type of NIL deal that they can get. And then second, um, you know, coaches are going to have a hard time managing their rosters because of what you just said. You know, I obviously take a kid or maybe a couple of kids with the expectation that they will be around for a certain amount of time. You know, lost are the days where two guys come in. Maybe they're, maybe they're in the same class. Maybe they're a year apart. One guy wins the job. The other guy waits his turn and hops in there. More and more in this day and age, you just need one good year in college football. So you mean a guy like Mac Jones might have actually done the right thing? <laughs> he just might have. Hang in there. You know, you never know what's going to happen. You never know what's going to happen. Work out. So far, it's working out pretty well for him. I mean, I, I guess where I'm looking at this, I wish that instead of saying we have a problem and waiting 15 years to fix it, I'm hoping, I guess, that the NCAA takes a good hard look at this in the near future and says, okay, maybe we made a mistake and we need to amend this somehow. Because, I mean, I just, you know, I follow like you, you know, you know, you follow Miami, I follow USC. I think they've got five or six kids in the portal. Now, frankly, I told some people in a fan group, mm -hmm. that's fine by me. I said, if every kid above the sophomore year wants to jump in the portal after last season, feel free to go ahead. Mm -hmm. Okay, But it's, it's still a bit ridiculous when every day I'm getting an alert on my phone, such and such entered the transfer portal. Yeah, it's a, it's it's amazing. I followed a transfer portal um, you know, Twitter account. And that thing's humming right now. I mean, there's just kids left and right jumping in there. And Emily, I don't even want to get into the numbers. It's probably for a separate show, maybe one of those shows I do with recruiting advice. But there are a ton of kids that don't end up at another school. So you had a scholarship at one school, and now you get stuck in the portal and you're not able to get a scholarship at another school. So you just forfeited an education, basically. Um, so, well, listen, I, I'm no professional football coach like you, but I can tell you one thing, having watched my own team this year, some of those kids jumping in the portal better hope, that, at least at USC, better hope they don't end up in that position, because having watched all those games, I can tell you, there's not going to be a line for some of them. Yeah, um, even stepping down a level, some of those kids run into resistance, so... 
We'll just have to see where this thing goes. I, I don't know if this is a good segue or a bad segue into the next thing we need to talk about, but um, your guy at USC, Lincoln Riley, kind of kicked off the big money sweepstakes. Ten years, I believe it's around a hundred million or 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 you know whatever the deal is. One hundred fifteen with the house, six million dollars outside LA. With all the with all the prizes totaled up, yes, um, that is the deal. You know, I shouldn't even say kicked it off because. The two coaches in the Big Ten, uh, Tucker and Franklin, got close to a hundred million. Yes. Um, you know, I believe uh, Kelly is ninety-five or a hundred. Uh, Mar- yeah, Mar- around the same range. Yeah, Mario Cristobal are around eighty-five million. Nick's negotiating right now. They're trying to annex part of the state for him. Just give him the land. You know, I don't know if you know this, but he does have something in his contract where he's to be paid amongst the top two or three. Um, Coaches in, in the SEC. So I, I mean, if you're Nick Saban's agent, you think that's not? Yeah, of course. That yeah. Only makes sense. And you know what? The school president will tell you it's money well spent, whatever it is. So sure it is. Yeah. So they're not going to have a problem adjusting his numbers. However, with all those numbers said, it is being alleged and reported out there that Jimbo Fisher had a 125 million dollar deal on the table to coach at LSU. I don't know if I believe it, Emil, but something about me wants to believe it. I think LSU was in a desperate kind of a situation, and um, it wouldn't surprise me if they did that. You know, kind of, listen, you had 95 go to, I believe Tucker's deal was 95, Franklin's yeah. deal was, was 85. I guess they wanted to make it a no-brainer type of thing for Jim Fisher, Jimbo Fisher, and uh, he said no. Well, he probably likes the bar that he drinks in before games. <laughs> that <laughs> 5 o'clock shadow that he has does give him oh, the drinker it's look. It's like they dragged him out of a bar with that 5 o'clock shadow and said, hey, you know, we have a game in that. Yeah, I mean, speaking of NILs, can you get together with Schicht or somebody and clean up? But, <laughs> but I mean, I'm kidding aside, I mean, LSU swung and missed a couple times, right? They wanted Riley. They, want, they wanted him. I, I don't know. I mean, there's part of me that says, okay, I believe the number. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, he had to take that number to Texas A&M and under the table basically get it or something. I don't know. I just don't see how you, you turn that down unless you use it to renegotiate your current deal. Maybe Jimbo Fisher knows something about LSU. and Or maybe he's just right what he said in the press conference. I've got things going pretty well here at Texas A&M. It definitely is a college town. I've been there. Um, they, you know, they, but so is Baton Rouge, right? sure, they love their Aggies and he was bringing in a tremendous class. He wasn't joking when he said that, you know, I would urge anyone listening to this to go take a look at the class that Jimbo Fisher is bringing in. So I think he feels pretty good recruiting for Texas A&M and thinks he can continue that there. And you know what? Yeah, it's 125 million, but I also would like to have some kind of a legacy in this coaching thing. And if I knocked off. Nick Saban here, maybe I can make a habit out of it. Or maybe if I really lay some roots here and Nick takes off, I could kind of jump into the top spot there. Well, I mean, I kind of think, first of all, as far as programs and the towns, I think they're comparable. They both throw money around. They both have facilities. I think there's probably, believe it or not, well, you, I'm sure you will believe this because mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. I think there's less pressure on him at Texas A&M if you want to know the truth. P- perhaps. You know, Jimbo's been in, he's been in Baton Rouge before as a coordinator, so he knows the deal there. Maybe the wife said no. Texas A&M hasn't won anything substantial in a long, long, long time. So I think, you know, when he throws out a 10-3 and season there and he gets ranked 14th in the country or 12th, which is a good year. I'm not trying to denigrate something like that. What I'm saying is I think they're genuinely happy. They would have liked to have won the whole thing. They would have liked to have won the SEC. But I think they look and say, hey, 10-win season, really good. You know, we got ranked in the top 15. Nice year. Uh, we have a good recruiting class. Like you say, that's a big thing in the South. Um, where I think at LSU, that season I just described is kind of like, eh. <laughs> yeah, he can also go 8-4 and four at Texas A&M and not spend the entire um, off season or whatever, um, you know, being on the hot seat. Hey, listen, when you run off a guy, whether it was right or wrong, I know there was issues surrounding the program. I'm not saying 
it was technically wrong. But the perception from the outside looking in, when you run off a guy who went 15-0 and and won a national championship two seasons ago at Ogeron, that's going to make a lot of people pause about going to your program, at least in the in the few. You know, until that wears off, till that memory goes away, mm-hmm. a lot of coaches are going to say, well, "I don't know, man. If you go fifteen and zero, win the national championship two years later, you're gone." I yeah, don't know if I want to be a part of that. And no question, and Jimbo Fisher's lived that life. He lived it at FSU, so um, perhaps he just knew the better of it. You know, some things better than money, I guess. So, well, it's not like you know when you get into what I call monopoly money. I mean, it's just like these baseball and football players. When you get into these upper echelon of contracts, there's something else that goes on in your head as to why you why you need it or you're taking it. In other words, whether Jim Bull Fisher is making $9 million a year or 11 or $12 million a year, he's living in Baton Rouge or College Station. Mm-hmm. He's buying everything he wants to buy. I mean, he, yeah. he, he ain't... Uh, of course. I mean, there's other things to chase. Um, so, yeah. and we, And who knows what he's getting... Off the books at Texas A and M, whatever he's at seventy five million dollars. Hey, this is an SMU. <laughs> I hear you. He probably doesn't pay for anything in College Station anyway. So what money is he spending? He doesn't pay for razor blades. I know that. Yeah, um, apparently he feels no need for that. Um, I want I want to look the part of a of a bum while making seventy five million dollars. <laughs> Sliding on to the NFL game, Emil, um Listen, we're guys that are. Um, we lived through the 70s, not even in the 70s. Did they play football the way these two teams played on Monday night? I'm talking about the Bills and Patriots, more notably the Patriots who decided to throw only three passes in a game and were right in doing so because they ended up being the winners. It was one big inside run drill uh, on Monday night. What do you make of a game like that? Well, I got to throw a plug in for my high school. My, our coach who retired a few years ago, as I think the second winningest coach in the history of Pennsylvania, he was there for 40 some years. That's the way we play football. Okay, I'm telling you, we threw the ball more than the Patriots did, and, and, and when I say that, it was barely more, like five or six times in a game, but yeah. it was more than the Patriots. Okay, I know. Yeah, your quarterback was a halfback type deal. Yeah, I didn't see any. I have never I've, in my life, and I've watched a lot of football now. You have too. Mm. I don't know if I've ever seen an NFL game. Or a quarterback only threw the ball three times. I don't think... I mean, I haven't checked to see if this has happened. It probably has. In the modern era, of course, that we're talking about. Uh, it probably has happened. I don't recall seeing it. Obviously, when you and I first started watching college football, that's something that could happen because the wishbone was, you know, um, the offense that was run. So you might get an Oklahoma or a Nebraska or maybe even a Notre Dame have a game like that. But to see it in the NFL was... Uh, a bit shocking, but damn it, Amel, it worked. And leave it to Bill Belichick to come well, up with a cold weather me plan. To the bigger point here, okay? I'm watching that game, and I, and I texted you during it. I don't understand, like, Buffalo, what they were doing. I mean, I, I, it's almost like they couldn't adjust. I mean, you can't tell me that, you know, two, comp, you know, two evenly matched, relatively evenly matched NFL teams mm. that – you know the team is going to run the ball. I mean, they're basically lining up in these heavy formations. They're telling you they're going to run the ball. Yeah. And you, you can't stop it? Like, there's nothing you can do? I think for too long in the game, Emil, um, the Bills were suspicious. <laughs> and it took them too long to really believe what they were seeing. And they got to a certain point, I want to say near the end of the third quarter or fourth quarter, where they really started attacking the run that was happening, you know, they were, they would, you know, without getting too technical, they'd run a linebacker through the spot the guard was leaving on the plays where they were pulling, which happened to be a lot of them, and they really kind of forced New England's hand, but at that point, New England had a commanding three-point lead, and in that game, three points was commanding, because you it couldn't, looked, you couldn't kick field goals. Seemed like they were, it seemed like they were running the same play where they take Neal, line him up just outside the tackle. Mm-hmm. I want to call it a crack back, but it wasn't. Essentially, was, you know. Essentially a crack back, but he was facing the guy. He'd come down, crack back, they'd pull the tackle around him, mm-hmm. and he'd go out and get the little guy. And, and as Vince Lombardi would say, we're going to run the ball in the alley. Yeah, I will give um, Josh McDaniel some credit. He he went in, They went in there with a simple game plan, and so... 
they would run that play. And if they got any sense that the Bills were like loading up on that, they'd run right up the middle and bring the Bills back into the middle and then go back outside. It was not complicated at all. It's the kind of game plan that you have when it's freezing and the wind is blowing unmercifully. I mean, you know what this opens up though, Emil? It's like the Patriots just beat you at your place with an unconventional game plan which leaves them open to running the normal game plan in a rematch and you still having to adjust to it. Oh, absolutely. You know, and since you do watch this, I'd be curious. Are you going to watch the 22 film on that? Uh, I think I because saw I it. I, I, I think... want your opinion on that next show if you can. I'd like to know what the Bills... I mean, maybe I missed this, but if I'm, if I'm the defensive coordinator for the Bills, keeping this simple, okay... I mean, I'm basically going to put, at some point, I'm just going to put a single high safety there, mm-hmm. put a man on every receiver, and load up the box and say, well, okay, go ahead. I mean, if you're going to throw it, throw it. Yeah, Emil, I don't know that I need to watch the all 22 because the TV shot had all 22 guys in it at, at a certain <laughs> point. <laughs> I mean, there's no need to pull out on this thing. They played the whole game in the middle of the screen, all 22 guys in there. So, um, you know... I know me personally. When I've I've been in games like that in high school, what's that? He, McDermott after the game, um, you could tell that they got beat up. At least I could, mm-hmm. just by the reaction of mm-hmm. how testy he was with the questions about the game plan, and you know the insinuation that he was out coached. Yeah, and you know without, without throwing his guys under the bus, it's almost like he said, "Hey, they got a man up." <laughs> I guess. I mean, I don't know why a coach wouldn't just go ahead and admit to being out coached by Bill Belichick. I mean, what's the harm in that? So, you know, that's that's what happened. He came with a cold weather plan and Trump, your cold weather plan, and you just got out coached by the legend um, in the NFL game. Just go ahead and own up to it. I, I don't know if you saw the two defenders, the, sa- the, the two safeties um, for the Bills after the game that were pretty upset with the questioning that was coming from the press row. Um and, you know, discussing that they had such trouble stopping the run. And that perhaps contributed to the outcome of the game. They were upset about it. But what they wanted to point out was that it was only 14 points scored. Okay, yes, I get it. But when you just keep giving up run plays like that and staying on the field, you rob your offense of an opportunity to to, to get get more possessions and get down the field. So, yeah, you only well, gave up 14 that, points. Both reporters aren't skilled enough to, to go, go there with the question because when they were all, you know, butt hurt, that would have been my next question. Yeah, they, you know, I get it. You only gave up 14 points, but you do understand the fact that an NFL team just came into your building, threw the ball three times, ran it for 200-some yards, and essentially controlled the game, keeping your all-world quarterback on the bench. Do you guys get that? I mean, that would have been my question. I actually got pissed at the two guys – for getting mad about that and really did feel like I was the reporter because I would have snapped back in that same fashion. Hey, guys, you gave up almost 300 yards rushing. The time of possession was ridiculous. The fact that you did that, I understand they only scored 14 points. That's because they decided to just run the ball down your throat. You robbed your all-star quarterback for more opportunities to get into the end zone and get a lead for you guys. You know, If you'd have stopped the run and they score here or there, it might have stopped you from having to deal with the run. Exactly right. Yeah, it was just a very weird, and that's why you know they know. I mean, I always say that, right? Whenever you say something in life and people kind of get hurt or pissed, you're probably close to the truth. Yeah, you're probably stepping on a nerve there. I don't know what's going on with your sound, but you sound a little bit far away, by the way, so... Uh, oh, man, how do I sound now? There you go. That's that's what we need. Uh, Rolling into this, the AFC playoff race, listen, I think for most of the year, people have been saying the NFC trumps the AFC, but uh, are we sure about that? I think the fact that there aren't any super records in the AFC are making people feel that way, but Emil, we've got a bunch of teams that are nudged together here. New England, Buffalo, Baltimore, Cincinnati. I knew you were going to go without even telling me this. (laughs) And do you know what I did for you? What'd you do? I actually, I actually did a little quick research. Do you know the score in the interconference this year? Lay it on me. The AFC's up two games. So it's not your imagination. Mm-hmm. The conferences are very comparable. Yes. 100% spot on. Yeah, there's so many teams. Like the last place team in the West is Denver at 6-6. Six and six. 
The last place team in the North is Cleveland at 6-6. Six and six. They're still in the playoff race. And here comes Miami at 6-7, and seven, winners of their last five in a row, I want to say. So everyone's in the playoff race, not named New York and Jacksonville in the AFC, which is crazy. Well, and same as in the NFC, if you really look at that seven seed. So I think the NFL's gotten what they want this year. And in a kind of beautiful way, uh, some years you'll get a lot of parity near the top of the league, but you'll have a lot of really uncompetitive bad teams. And I don't feel like that this year. We have a few like you're going to have every year. But I feel like there's a lot of teams with four, five, six wins that the true, you know, cliche, any given Sunday can step up. We have good teams like we will every year, but they're eight, four, nine, and three good. The only team that seemed to get away a little bit is your Arizona Cardinals, who are mm-hmm. ten and two. But generally, we have our good teams, but they're not so good that they're, you know, they've separated to the point that they're unbeatable. Mm-hmm. And you know, we have teams that are competitive. It's actually been to me a very interesting season. Yeah, I'm uh, very pumped for the playoffs. Um, to to just see how everything unfolds here. Obviously, I'm you know rooting for the Cardinals. This is a good time to remind everyone that Emil and I both picked Green Bay and Buffalo to be in the Super Bowl. Right now, Buffalo looks wishy-washy. And uh, over in the NFC, um, I would not like to see Green Bay uh, in the Super Bowl for, for very selfish reasons. But um, sure. many consider them to be the top team in the NFC right now, despite being... Nine and three to Arizona's ten and two. I'm fine with that though. You know, they're Arizona. Uh, I don't. You know, honestly, this year I'm not sure you can honestly. I mean, you, you can always take a shot at it, but right now I'm not sure you can handicap this whole thing on either side intelligently. Mm-hmm. No, I think we're going to need to see how these teams over the last five weeks of the season how they develop because some teams are obviously going to get a lot better mm-hmm. and some are going to get worse. I texted you the other night. People forget last year. After 12 games, Tampa Bay was 7-5. and five. Mm-hmm. They won their last eight games. They won the Super Bowl. Yeah, um, and if I'm a Tampa Bay fan, I wouldn't worry at all about where they stand right now. I mean, they are 9-3, and three, but uh, after that Super Bowl year, teams tend to kind of not take the regular season as serious as maybe they should, having been through a whole postseason before. They just kind of want to skip the regular season and get to the postseason. So I wouldn't bug out too much about... Tampa Bay, uh, maybe not looking as formidable as people remembered them being at the end of last year. They do have a big game against the Bills this weekend, which will be very interesting. But um, we'll talk about maybe some of these matchups when we make our picks at the end. Time now for us to segue into our main topic on the show today. And that is Emil and I ranking the high-profile hires in college football that have occurred here uh, seemingly in the last week. Uh, and I'm probably right by that. With all within the last seven to eight days here, we've had these big high-profile well, hires. First domino fell was Riley, and that was the Sunday before last. So we're nine days from him. So yeah, you're pretty much the last week. Yeah, all within ten days here, we've had all these high-profile hires. And what better and more fun than to rank them? Because we love ranking stuff uh, in the sports world and in this country. So Emil and I are going to rank. We're going to do this, Emil, like we do probably everything we do like this so we'll we'll start from the bottom um i guess to give the parameters we only have six jobs that qualify as big time jobs yeah uh, there's one power five um hire that i think we're probably both going to leave off of this thing uh, but outside of that you guys know who the who the teams were that that i don't want to go through a list here but you guys know there's six teams out there that have recently hired big time programs, blue bloods, whatever you want to call them. And so we're going to just run through this. Who's going first, me or you? Should we flip a I'll coin? Throw out my number six, and then you throw out your number six. All right, sounds good. There we go. My number six is, is you know, a, a school you have ties to. Uh, and it's only because I feel uh, I don't know enough about them. It's. It's Bill, Bill Napier, is that how you say his name? Billy Napier, yes, Billy Napier. Yes. I'm putting him at six for Florida because I think the expectations at Florida are very unrealistic. I think he's coming up in class. That's not to say he can't do it. Um, most coaches do go that route, but we just don't know what he's going to do with the proverbial Porsche now that he's graduated from the Chevy. So, um, you know, I'm putting him at number six. Um, you know what? Here we go. I'm I'm right there with you. So I just want to preface this by saying I happen to like 
every last one of the hires at these six schools. Um, I will say that um, on some level, there's differing, there's differing degrees sure. of like, but none of these I feel right now is a bad hire. Time will tell, but I'm with you on that. I, Florida, number six, um, for much of the same reasons that you said, there's not a whole lot out there about Billy Napier. Yes, he did a fine job at Louisiana um, and coached them all the way into you know a conference championship. He came in there and turned things right around, double-digit wins every season, very successful at that level. Based on history, though, I would have liked to have seen him gone to an, an, another school, maybe one more notch up that's not a Florida. Um, and when I say history, it's like I kind of look at what happened with Urban Meyer, Bowling Green, then Utah, then Florida. Hardcore Florida fans will cite to me, oh, well, Steve Spurrier came from Duke over to Florida and he got the job done. There were no championships before Steve Spurrier got there, so he didn't have this big expectation thing hanging over his head. When Urban Meyer came, he had that, and so he had a little bit of extra experience. Billy Napier's coming into Sp Spurrier, Urban Meyer, and then a sea of guys that got you know uprooted before they could get to year four, and um, he not bringing that experience. This is another Saban disciple, and so there's not a whole lot known about him. I hope he can recruit. He's not bringing a big name behind him. I, yeah, I guess he can throw the Alabama it's thing out there. You mentioned Duke. I was going to use that as an example and say maybe you're saying maybe get the Duke job next and then go to Florida. Sure, yeah. Um, yeah. Get Just go up a level before you jump into this pool. I, you know, Without going into it again, uh, Florida fans are extremely um, – they have very big expectations, and they can be unruly about those expectations. So um, I'd well, put them at six – to the Ryan Days and Lincoln, you know, Lincoln Riley's who did well jumping right in the pool. But then you look, there's a there's a list of people far longer that failed. Even a guy as good, as, uh, you know, as good as a coach as Luke Fickle is, his first time through when they handed him Ohio State, it wasn't so good. Emil, I'm going to I'm going to sound crazy. Maybe to some fans listening to this, the jury's still out on Ryan Day. He was left the keys to a Porsche. And, you know, he hasn't driven it long enough yet for me to say, oh, okay, you know, you did just, you did no, just get, get beat by point. Michigan. So. No, I get your point. He's still recruiting, though, and I get your point completely. I'm at, I'm at the Yeah, that table was set there. Let me see Ryan Day in year five. You know me in my five years. I understand. No, okay, so let's, let's hop up to my, uh, my this, number five. This is going to get interesting. Yeah, my number five, I went back and forth. So I don't want to give away my number four, but I will say this. It was close, and the only reason I'm putting him here is I just don't know enough about him as a head guy. I, I put Oklahoma and Brent Venables. I think he's a really good defensive guy. He's been in a big-time program at Clemson. Um, now, he's, now he's got to run the whole thing. And, you know, obviously what he does on the offensive side of the ball is going to have a, a big effect on recruiting and all that stuff. I know we can coach defense. I saw him do it. <laughs> so yeah. I put him at five. And I don't, it doesn't mean I don't think he's a good hire. I just I, I put him at five. That's that. Number five for me is Marcus Freeman at Notre Dame. Now, outside of my own school's hire, there's no one I'm going to root more for than Marcus Freeman. Um, I just love the way he goes about things. He's a defensive guy. I love what he does on defense. I love the way that he goes about coaching. I love his philosophy on coaching, his attitude. I love the way the players love him there. The truth of the matter is, this is your first gig, and it's at Notre Dame. And you haven't even been a coordinator, really, for that long. So um, I, will give, I will give some points for this being a seamless transition because he was actually there last year. The players know him, so there's a familiarity there. But um, this is your first job. It's Notre Dame, and then recruiting to Notre Dame has its challenges, its pitfalls. Um, it seems you have an admin there that can be kind of heavy-handed in terms of getting players into school. So there's a lot that a first-time guy is going to have to deal with. And so I put this one at five, but like I said, I'm rooting for this like crazy. Well, and you know, to piggyback, make it simple, he was my number four. I went back and forth on those mm. two. I gave him a couple bonus points for being a seamless transition. Uh, I, I completely hear what you're saying. I mean, this is his first coaching gig, mm -hmm. period, as far as head coaching. Mm -hmm. And you're at Notre Dame. And that's going to be challenging. It's going to present its own set of challenges. But I, I kind of like the fact that it is seamless and that they have a veteran team coming back for his first season. So I put him at four, but I could have went either way with my four and five. So Sure. Um, 
Four was a tough one for me because I do like the hire, but there is the, the talk of fit, and that is Brian Kelly at LSU. What I love is the experience that he's bringing to the table. Um, he's been a winner where he's gone. Um, he came to Notre Dame from Cincinnati. I believe he, he might have been at Western Michigan or one of the Mac schools before that. He was a winner there. And so he's been a winner everywhere that he's gone. The thing is, he was at Notre Dame for a very long time, and you kind of get used to some things uh, when you're at a place for that amount of time. And now you're moving into the SEC. I, I feel like this decision for him to move here was kind of born out of thinking he had a really, really great team. I want to say it was in 2012. And um, he got completely dominated by Alabama. I think he wanted to be, he wanted to, around that time, he probably said, one day I think I want to just jump into this SEC and be able to come to the party with a gun the size of the guy that's across from me. But um, he's going to find out what this whole recruiting thing is all about in the SEC. Yeah, you mean that Nerf gun, right? Because we don't want anybody out there to get, to get nervous or offended. You, you meant that metaphorically, right? Sure, yeah. Gun. Yeah, a uh, water gun. But, okay. but whatever whatever the case may be, um, he's... Uh, you know what's happening here? You like Brett Venables higher more than I do because my number three is Kelly. So you keep going because I, I, my, I put Kelly at three and I gave him benefit of the doubt on the fact that he's been a winner everywhere, as you said. Mm-hmm. I think the fit might be interesting. Um, I saw the fake Southern accent that he was trying the other day, <laughs> which came off as really hokey. Um, so we'll see how that goes. So, so obviously, you keep going. I have him three, so you have him four. So obviously, you have Venables a heck of a lot higher than I did. Yeah, because number three for me is Miami um, and Mario Cristobal. Um, you know, former teammate of mine, someone I have a relationship with. Um the only thing, the only reason why this isn't one or two for me is just my suspicion as to what he's going to be provided with. Now, the- oh, stop! You know what, folks? Listen, this guy played for Miami. He's doing what all fans do right now. He's mm. hedging. He doesn't want. To oh do- no! There's no hedging for me. Fans here will know this. By the way, it's funny that you're saying this because you can't see me. Um, but this is being filmed to possibly be on YouTube. I have on a UM hat and a UM shirt. So uh, it's interesting that you say those words. But no, it's not that. It's that um, we're still holding out on, even though he's been given this contract, there's just been 20 years of battery <laughs> that you have to overcome as to how hard, how much support is he going to get. And just so how much has to be undone community-wise to start getting recruiting back to where it was 15, 20 years ago, you are going to have to fight Alabama and Georgia and Ohio My State. And LSU. A here. I am. Okay. Um, I am. And obviously, I, you know, obviously I love the hire, even though I thought Manny Diaz would have gotten more time. But, um, you know, I'm, my, my, I, I can I can like both things. As you say, mu- I, those things don't have to be mutually exclusive. Well, here's, well, here's I, what gets funny. Our whole list is the same except for Venables because I have Cristobal at number two. So mm. I'm going first. I had him at two. You have him at three. I'm a closet Miami fan. If I wasn't a, if USC stopped playing football tomorrow, I'd be a Miami fan. And let me tell you something. I am really excited about this hire. I've been calling for this for a year. I'm mm. like, just go get the guy. I hit. I told you on Sunday. I feel like I hit a parlay, okay? Because he went and to a school that I happened to like to root for, mm-hmm. and made my favorite team's job even easier. Yeah. Yes. I think that's why you're most giddy. But anyway. No, no, no. Trust me, I'm very excited for Miami in this. I think they got. Well, let me put it this way: if you give this guy time and he doesn't win there, then I'm not sure what the next the answer is. Yeah, that's the other part for me that scares the hell out of me. If it doesn't work with Mario Cristobal and the amount of money that is uh, sounds like it's going to be put out there, it's it's going to be trouble. So uh, we definitely need this to work. Uh, and I feel with his recruiting chops and the way that he connects with people, we got a really, really good chance of getting... Did you get to read the article I sent you where the person who wrote it said basically that my, you know, the Miami fan base should thank USC because the schools are very much intertwined. You know, there's three major private universities that have done very well in football. USC, Miami, and Notre Dame. Mm-hmm. And, and the fact that USC is in a big city like Miami, of course, on, on the other coast. Mm-hmm. And when they stepped up and spent the money... This writer said it almost made Miami look at themselves and go, 
well, they're a prestigious academic institution that we want to be considered part of that club, and they're spending money on football. Maybe we need to. Amal, I have a tweet out there a couple of days ago thanking two entities for what has now happened. Kirk Herbstreet for the rant that he went on on college game day, calling out the administration, and USC, the West Coast twin of the University of Miami, private school, big city, doesn't have their own stadium. There's so many things that are alike, and USC saying, we're, we're not going to worry about all these things that we have against us now in college football. We're going to go get our guy, spend some money, and do that. It kind of forced the University of Miami's hand because uh, they didn't... I think we used to wallow. We used, we had a drinking partner in USC, where, you know what I mean? They're down in the dumps. We're down in the dumps, and we're just gonna brown bag it and drink our sorrows away. And when um, USC decided to go to some AA meetings and clean their act up, we went too. So I'm very thankful for that. Um, you have Miami too. I have Oklahoma at two, and the hiring of Brent Venables. My reason for this is. Brent Venables, to me, seems a whole lot like Kirby Smart. You spent a good amount of time in one of the, uh, not the second best program over the last few years in college football, which is Clemson. You picked up a lot of great things. Um, maybe there's a little part of me that's a bias since I've met Venables. We've had several conversations. I know the kind of person that he is. Um, I saw his introductory press conference. I like the principles and philosophy that he's going to bring to Oklahoma. Um, and I don't think you're going to lose anything there. What's going to probably surprise fans, and this is something that's difficult for people to understand, is don't be surprised if Oklahoma's defense is not great under Venables. Don't be surprised if Oklahoma's offense continues to be out of this world under Brent Venables. What happens when a defensive coordinator takes a head coaching job? You lose the defensive coordinator. And oftentimes they have a difficult time finding someone that will do exactly what they did defensively. However, you're an expert on what gives you problems defensively. And you're able to do a really good job going out and finding an offensive coordinator that gives... If that offensive coordinator can impress Brent Venables and gives Brent Venables problems, he's going to give everyone else problems. So... Um, yeah, that makes perfect sense when you think about it. And especially if, if someone is experienced enough to understand that they need to be the CEO. I'm not a big fan of, of uh, coaches going to a program, becoming the head coach, but then burying themselves in the side of the ball they came from. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not a big fan of that. Yeah, um, uh, me, me either. I mean, it's worked in a few times, but it's failed sure. more often than not. And he's already on record as saying he's going to hire a defensive coordinator. So I like the experience, and he's been at OU, so he's not walking totally blind into it like, like, like let's say, a Brian Kelly coming to Notre Dame. He's been there. He was there at OU during a time when they were successful. They won a national championship there. He was a defensive coordinator. Um, so he'll be well-received. He has the experience. He's coming from a top-flight program. I think there's a lot of good things for him there. So I'm higher on this as a guy who's a first-time head coach than maybe most people or a lot of people. I like it. Is you and I had the exact same list, except we I flipped the Venables down to five. You have them at two, and everything else above and in between is the same. And I, I mean, not because I'm a fan. I just, I don't know how you can't put the Lincoln Riley higher at number one. I mean, the guy's got everything you would want in a guy going to Los Angeles. He's got the swagger, the look. He's done it at a big time program um, and done it quite successfully. And he's 38 years old. He's still ascending. He's still a guy that's, you know, I mean, you're probably going to lose him to the NFL someday if he's successful, but mm. so what? Sure. Um, a young hotshot coach in Los Angeles. It seems like a really, really great fit. His um, expertise is coaching up quarterbacks and making them Heisman Trophy winners. And right now, California is producing that in large quantities. So... You're going to get your quarterbacks, and when you get your quarterbacks, all these other recruits tend to fall in place. Receivers want to go there. Offensive linemen want to go there, and it just it's a run, one big party, and I think it's such a great fit because there were some names that were out there that I wasn't too sure would be able to fit in Los Angeles. I mean, you're fighting for attention in, Cal in Los Angeles right now. It's, it's always been a happening place, but Los Angeles is really, really happening now, and this is the absolute right kind of hire that you needed to make, so... The only thing that worries me is everyone is saying this, so you know how I am with following the herd. Sure. I, I, well, again, I, I, I don't, you know, I, th I think we're all saying it in a, as a sense that it's hard to envision the guy falling flat on his face to what extent he 
you know, and how, how high he goes is, is a different conversation. But I don't see him falling flat on his face. I like the fact that he, that he's a quarterback whisperer because, let's be honest, the sport in, at both of the highest levels, the NFL and college, is really quarterback driven. If you have a quarterback that's a stud, you're going to be in every game generally. Sure. Um, and and let's, let's face it, a big part of why you and I like this as well is it's the Pac-12 and no one's killing it there right now. And you even pointed this out a couple of picks ago that um, Oregon now has a little bit of a void. I don't know who they're going to hire, but that was seen as the biggest competition for Riley coming in. And now they have an opening at the top spot there in Oregon. Yeah, and there's talk, and you know, I don't know if it's fan chatter more than actual thinking inside the school. You know that you know, back to the future. Let's bring Chip Kelly back, and I'm that those things rarely work either in sports. Uh, when you go back to somebody that's had success at a place, usually the second go around is not as good as the first. Actually. Yeah, I think Chip Kelly's probably smarter than that, so I can't see him going there. And didn't he leave on some show of cause type deal there? I don't, I don't know about that. He yeah. did. He had, there were some issues there, but you just know. I mean, I going back to the days, guys from you know younger audience members won't remember, but Robinson left USC. He was a national champion. He went to the NFL, coached your favorite team at the time, mm-hmm. uh, the Rams with Eric yeah. Dickerson. Sure. And when that ran his course, he went back to USC in the late '80s, early '90s. I forget the exact years, and it was very mediocre at that point. It was just it was stale. Yeah, rarely do you come back and make it as good or even better. So um, hopefully Chip doesn't fall into that trap. You know what? Stay there in UCLA and bang it out with Riley, and let's see what happens. I would love to see USC UCLA be a really really big thing again. One of those things that reminds me of my childhood. So that's our list. Um, they're close to being the same, but they're not. So you guys could jump on that. You guys have any comments on that, feel free to drop an email to cwilson at gridironstuds.com. Or if you're on Anchor, you can drop a voice message if you're watching this on YouTube. That comment section is open. Go ahead and drop it in there. Who got the list right? Was it me or is it Amo? Go ahead, hit us up on that. All right, time for some NFL picks before we hit the road here. Emil, I made a proclamation last week. I really, truly believed in it. And I swore it was going to go down. And at the very least, I was going to be 2-1 and one last week in the NFL. First of all, I'm extremely happy as the way I closed out the college football season. I don't want to pat my own back. I'm going to let you do that. But I'm really upset that I didn't come through in the NFL last week. Well, I was going to say, let's focus on the good and not the bad. Uh, my man here laid out back-to-back 3-0 and weeks in college, okay? Very impressive, Chad. Six straight wins. You finish college before we get to our bowls next week. You're 20-16. and 16. Very nice. Just three winners in college last week. Baylor with the outright over Oklahoma State. Michigan, uh, who may have beaten the worst 10-2 and two team I've ever seen in my life in Iowa. I think they just scored again. I, I think they did. And finally, <laughs> Pitt just put it to Wake Forest, so that was very nice. You, 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 like I said, six straight, twenty and sixteen. Hey, I want to stop you there, Emil. We didn't talk about this. What do you think about the fake slide by Pickett? You know how I feel as a coacher of defense. Uh, I'm not a fan because, again, if we're going to call these these penalties that are game changing penalties, then there has to be some prohibition from a guy faking something that could create you know what if i pull up and tear an acl i mean the the point is he he got an advantage by using the rules so they're gonna have to look at this in the off season and say well once you 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 go into that slide or the referee determines you you know you basically fake this like a fake fair catch you're down yeah man look we call these guys defenseless players you know who was defenseless on that play the defeat the the defense no, I didn't like it. I don't like, and again, I'm not even a fan of the rule. Like, I think once these quarterbacks get outside the pocket, um, you can hit them. <laughs> I'm done. Yeah, I feel you. I just, I've been around defensive players all my life, and I know the thought process. Those guys probably do need protection. I could see a submarine head first shot to a guy sliding, and someone's asleep on the field. So, but damn it, man, I don't need a fake slide runoff. No, I don't like that. So, anyway, getting back, I agree with you. My college was 2-1. Uh, and one. I had Baylor like you. I, I really liked them. I had Utah, which was another easy winner. I just, their physical, or an Oregon's coach checked out. He, Cristobal, he was out of there. He wasn't, you could just, he, was, he wasn't interested. 
And my loser, I got suckered on this one. I, I thought Cincinnati would win, but a very tight game against Houston, and they took care of business. Apparently, they wanted that playoff badly, so that was my loser. Hmm. I was 2-1 in college. I finished college 17-19 and 19 going into the Bulls. Now, sliding over to the NFL, Chad made his proclamation, and uh, his only winner was the Lions. He did get their How about that? How about the Lions coming to save me? <laughs> they did. How about that? The Lions play hard every week. i got to give them credit. Um, you had the Bengals. I don't know what they were doing, but uh, they got completely waxed at home by the by the Chargers. They got it close for a while, but then they went back to their losing ways, and you know they lost by 19 at home. The Broncos, almost a cover, kind of. You got 10 points, but 22-9, that doesn't help. Almost doesn't count. So you were 1-2, and two, so you're 14-21 and 21 in the pros. Put you at 34 and 38 overall. I was one and two in the pros. Uh, the Buccaneers kicked a late, needless field goal. That's the story. Yeah, of gambling. yeah, that sucks. And the, the Atlanta Falcons lost. They were 11 point dogs. They got beat by 13. Um, somehow, I trusted the Raiders after their Thanksgiving Day and 10 days off. I figured they could take care of the Washington Football Team. They lost a close one, and I got a winner. Uh, I told. The Steelers were a prideful team. They got the outright against the Ravens. Uh, so that yes, was good team. pick there. That was a good pick. That's my only one. I was one and two, 22 and 14. I'm still having a good year in the pros. Most definitely. Overall, I'm 39 and 33. So we head to this week with only pro picks. All right, so let me kick this off since I'm getting my rear end kicked in the NFL this year. I'm going to reproclimate my proclamation. But anyway, um, Emil, this will make you happy. The uh, Cowboys are facing the Indians. Yes, I said it. The Cowboys are facing the Indians. I'm going with the Cowboys. Um, Washington obviously spearheaded their recent um, thrust forward, their four-game win streak by beating Tampa Bay. But since then, they have uh, been successful against some washed-up squads. We're talking about Carolina, Seattle, Las Vegas. So, you know... Color me unimpressed as the Cowboys come to town. And for the Cowboys, man, this is a big game, Emil, because the next three weeks are serious for them. They've got Washington on Sunday. Then they've got to go take the Giants on. And then they get this Washington team at home again. They need to start, They need to kick off this three-week stint with a, with a victory. And I just feel like they're the better team right now. I know Washington has um, had some success lately, but I just think that's a little bit of a, a quick surge. I just think we're looking at two teams here where one is clearly better than me, and that's the Cowboys um, who are trying to make a strong push for not only the playoffs and a division win, but possible home field advantage. They can't afford to go out there and lallygag, if I could say that, against the Indians. <laughs> I'm trying to get thrown. I don't know, man. And and you know what? I've been watching Yellowstone lately, so I don't know why I'm even doing stuff like this. <laughs> I don't know why I'm behaving in this manner. Uh, let's slide over to Houston. Man, the Houston Texans could be the worst team ever. They lost 31 to nothing last week to the Indianapolis Colts in a divisional game. You would think they would know something about the Colts, but they went out there and got drug up and down the field. Word is Houston didn't even, I haven't seen the game yet, didn't even cross the 40-yard line of the Colts in the game. No way you would pick Houston in any kind of a football game unless you're me. Uh, the Seattle Seahawks are 4-8. and eight. I think last week was their, you know, um, was probably their, their swan song, let me say. I don't think this team could put together back-to-back -to -back wins. Like General Custer or something? <laughs> Custer's last game? No, man. Um, the, this team isn't it right now. They've got a lot of stuff going on. Yes, I know they beat a division foe, San Francisco, last week. It's a team that, that they're familiar with. But they're 4-8. and eight. They're out of this playoff race. I don't know how much luster they've got going on the road and taking on a Houston team. I see a letdown here, and they're not good enough to overcome a letdown. Um and they're not good enough right now to be a seven and a half point favorite. This is still the NFL, and I know Houston doesn't, you know, bring a lot of excitement in terms of their possibilities of winning a game. But I certainly like them getting seven and a half points at home off of a uh, shutout loss. So I'm going to ride with the Texans at home. They don't get this done for me. They're probably dead to me for the rest of the season. And uh, finally, I'm going to roll with the San Francisco 49ers who have been playing good football lately. I just spoke about what happened to them last week. I was a bit surprised. 
about them losing to the Seattle Seahawks, but when you play a divisional game, anything can happen. This is a team that's playing strong football, still has a chance, still has a chance to get into the playoff race. They've won three of their last four, overall playing pretty good football, and I like them right now against a Cincinnati team that let me down last week, but I don't think they're playing great football at the moment. Is this a revenge pick? Come on. It might be a revenge pick, but you know what? This could this might have the looks of a Cincinnati team that can't get their act together after blowing out a Pittsburgh team that they're usually getting handled by. So the hangover so might last another week. This line here because this line is fishy to me, which is why well, I, I support your pick because of the fishy line. I show the 49ers as a point and a half favorite. Yeah, um, I have them at minus one. We can go at a point and a half. That's fine for me. Um, I, I just like San Francisco here to snap back against yep. the Cincinnati Bengals. Like, why wouldn't the Bengals be a three-point favorite in this game, right? After getting, exactly right. Yeah, after that, getting blown what, out. Yes. Okay, so recapping, Chad's got the Dallas Cowboys minus four. He's staying in the state of Texas with the Houston Texans plus seven and a half. And then he swings out west for the gold rush and takes the San Francisco 49ers, giving a point and a half. Yes, there we go. I'm very, I'm very scared because my first pick, uh, I hate jinx them, but I really do like the Cowboys. I looked at this game. Holy crap, has this ever happened? You and I like the yeah. Cowboys on the same week? Yeah, I know. This is weird. <laughs> Yeah. But, I mean, I looked at the game and I said, okay, yeah, they started off with that win against Tampa, which was impressive. Very good defensive game, win by 10. Then they go and they win a game against Carolina, who's up and down. It's a, it's a tie game in the fourth. They kick a couple field goals, win 27-21. They got to stop a two-pointer at home against Seattle, 17-15. You just talked about what Seattle is. They're a mess. Mm -hmm. The Raiders... They're the Raiders. Go explain them. They beat Dallas on Thanksgiving Day in overtime. They come home and they lose by two to the to, to, to Washington. So, I mean, again, mm, I look and say, yeah, it's a little bit of a surge, but it's the NFL. Where where do the where do where does Washington really have an advantage on Dallas? I don't see one. Right. Unless Dallas goes out there and just shoots themselves in the foot, which is possible. I, I don't see how they don't win this game by seven to ten points. So I'm with you. I'm on the Cowboys now. I agree. Totally. <laughs> yeah, that's where it gets really scary, though. We all talk before we do this. My next pick, Houston, Texas. Holy I smokes. I looked at this game, and I said to myself, okay, I know Seattle-San Francisco is a rival. They, they gave everything they had in that game. They wanted to take the 49ers out. Your sound's, your sound's going messed up here. I want the folks to hear your wisdom. Texans were embarrassed last week. So I'll gladly take seven and a half in this game. Absolutely. You know what? I agree with you again, Engel. Yes. And then finally I got one where when everybody runs in one direction and hammers somebody, I run toward them. I'm going to take the Buffalo Bills plus three against Tampa on Sunday. How about logic that? logic for this is simple. The Buccaneers' defense just hasn't been what it was last year. You can move the ball on Tampa, and I think Buffalo – playing a game like they did with a high-powered offense, being embarrassed, I think they're going to be chomping at the bit to get that taste out of their mouth. And to be honest with you, this is a huge game for Buffalo. You lose this game, you're 7-6. and six. You go from being a, a, a trendy Super Bowl pick to start the year to maybe not making the playoffs. So I think Buffalo gives you everything they got on Sunday. And to your point, Tampa... Yeah, they want playoff seeding, but they're the defending champs. I mean, they understand they still got to win the tournament. I'm not sure if this is as big a game to them as it is Buffalo. So I'm going to take the Bills plus the field ball. Yeah, um, I don't know if we have stats on this, but this would have to be one of the widest um, temperature <laughs> temperature discrepancies between two games because it's, it's bound to be 80 in Tampa on uh, on. Listen. Buffalo will get off that plane and just soak the sunshine in. They're going to be very happy when they, when they step foot in Florida. Massive humidity they're going to feel, but they should love that. So Yeah, they should love that. So that's my logic there. I just think it's the Bills' last stand here. 
All right, well, um, wrapping this up, this dude just pretty much copied my Scantron for this test this week. But uh, no, he's got Dallas minus four. We both agree on that. Uh, we both like Houston plus seven and a half. He likes the Bills as underdogs, and I can't really disagree here. Like this Buffalo, you got to stand up, man. You got to stand up. You just got, you just got your lunch money taken at your house on Monday. You got to come back with something, man, or we're gonna have to just write you and your. Hey, Chad, you know the other thing, not to get, you know, again, because if we knew who was gonna win, right? All mm. the audience, us, we'd all be millionaires. But here's the thing: I look at this. The, the big, just the, obviously, the Bills last two weeks against Indy and New England have had trouble stopping the run. Mm -hmm. And Tampa just seems like one of those teams that no matter what, they don't want to run. They're almost like from the Andy Reid school. Like, oh, you mean we have to run once in a while? They just want to throw the ball. I bet this was a this would be a game where Tom Brady would like to, you know, sub in Bill Belichick and, you know, let's just go hand the ball to Leonard Fournette thirty five times and do what's right in this game because these guys obviously seem to be a pillow against a run. But um, let's not do it this week because we got the Bills here on the show. And that's our picks. That's our topic. We ranked the offseason hires and we touched on some other things here. We got the job done and we are ready to usher you off into your weekend of football, minus college football here. But we summarized what was a great championship week. I assume you will be spending the weekend in the desert. I will be in the desert getting lathered up for that big Monday night football game between the Rams and the Arizona Cardinals. Really, really looking forward to that, as well as the rest of the college, uh, the NFL slate. No college football again. Um, so I'm happy we're able to get all this done here for you. Once again, before you check out, if you haven't done it yet, go ahead and hit the subscribe button on whatever you are streaming this podcast on. We would greatly appreciate that. If you're watching this on YouTube, go ahead and subscribe to my channel. Got a bunch of great stuff here for you. Follow Emil on Facebook. Check me out on Twitter. You got a lot of stuff to do here um, when we jump off. But we do appreciate you being here and spending your time with us. And until next week, for Emil Calamino, I'm Chad Wilson. Thank you for watching the Gridiron Stud Show.